Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this morning with Bank of Ireland. Uh, we are delighted to be joined by some of our uh, fabulous speakers this morning. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we have Hilary Coates, Head of Health Sector with uh, Bank of Ireland. We have Gerardo Larius Rizzo, Head of Hospitality Sector. And we have Owen Clifford, Head of the Retail Sector with Bank of Ireland joining us this morning. Uh, this morning's session will be a look at, I suppose, sectoral, uh, sectoral updates in light of COVID-19. The guys will take us through the, uh, the updates there and what information is, is relevant to us right now. Um, I suppose we're all getting used to the new norm and we are, I suppose, trying to find our way back at this point. Um, and obviously Bank of Ireland are with us every step of the way. Um, would also just like to welcome Helen and Pam from our local branch here in Waterford. And uh, they're on hand, obviously, if you have any questions that pertain to local issues. Uh, you can obviously ask questions through the chat box um, or raise your hand or through the, the Q&A and the guys will get to them as they go through. Uh, I think the order for this morning, if I'm right, is Hilary first, then Gerardo followed by Owen. So without uh, further ado, I just finally want to say thank you to the guys for joining us this morning. And I'll hand straight over to Hilary. Uh, thanks very much, Linda, and good morning, everybody. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the CEO of the Warford Chamber, Gerald Hurley, for inviting us to this webinar, and thank my colleagues, uh, Pamela Pym and Helen Leahy, for organising us uh, to speak, and indeed, thank all of you for joining us this morning. So uh, the threat of COVID-19 to lives and livelihood will really only fully resolve when enough people are either um, uh, immune to the disease or we have a vaccine. And the evidence is accumulating that the first wave of the pandemic um, has left us with only limited uh, immunity, well below the required herd immunity that we've all been hearing about. So do we have to wait for a vaccine before returning to the new normal? Or what is the new normal? These are the type of questions we've been asking ourselves uh, in the bank. And looking at the, the, the health sector then as a whole, well, as you know, any of you working in the health sector, the COVID-19 pandemic for the health sector was firstly a health crisis. Initially, the main focus was on managing the crisis and the impact on patients with a secondary focus on finance. But for some segments of the, the health sector, there was an immediate focus on finance and indeed staff, specifically doctors, dentists, other professionals such as opticians, physios, um, where their income was really based on elective practice, much which was deemed not essential in the first wave of the pandemic. And, and many of these uh, professions had to both furlough staff or let them go and really shut up the doors of their practices. I know in Bank of Ireland within the first two weeks of the confirmed, uh, first confirmed case of COVID, we had multiple requests for payment breaks from healthcare professionals who reported cancellations, postponements of uh, elective appointments as social distancing impacted and closures occurred. And in order for these practices to, uh, to reopen safely for customers and patients, there'll be a requirement to put in infrastructure and implement new ways of working that will accommodate uh, physical distancing and indeed prevent the spread of infection. All of these come, of course, with cost implications. And we've seen a number of uh, funding requests for reconfiguration of businesses and the adoption of new technologies, uh, telehealth. So I think probably uh, the time for technology is here. Looking at the whole infrastructure, I know that the 2018 National Development Plan uh, identified the need for the exchange excuse me, Exchequer to invest about 11 billion in projects such as building the new women's hospital, um, opening the second cardiac centre in Washford, upgrading public hospital facilities 
and public nursing homes. Uh, last week, the World Health Organization recommended that hospitals just operate at 80% occupancy and not the 8% that most Irish hospitals operate at. And the HSC last week advised the the doll that the existing infrastructure in many of our public We'll give it one more second and then uh, if not, I can. Sorry, oh. I, I, yeah, apologies. I, I, I don't know what happened there. We were disconnected. Um, and so given the cost of the, uh, the, the pandemic, it is unlikely that the Exchequer will have the funds required to reconfigure the existing public hospitals or build the required infrastructure. Um, that is likely that the public will demand an investment in healthcare, both infrastructure and technology. And looking at nursing homes, then nursing homes have certainly felt the COVID nineteen headwinds during the pandemic. Fifty six percent of all uh, nursing homes remained COVID free, and the great majority of the thirty thousand residents living in nursing homes never contracted the virus. However, um, 18% of residents in nursing homes had a confirmed diagnosis. And tragically, despite all the best efforts of staff and operators, over 50% of those that have died from COVID uh, lived in nursing homes. But the evidence is changing in relation to COVID on a daily basis. At the moment, the greatest significance identified to the spread of COVID include testing to confirm status, uh, contact tracing, cough etiquette, hand hygiene, surface cl cleaning and physical distancing. And it's, it's important to remember that for older people with cognitive impairment, um, these mitigants are very challenging for operators. And this is compounded by factors outside the control of operators include delayed testing and contact tracing, shortage of PPE, and the failure to redeploy staff to high risk uh, sectors. These risks, I think, were compounded by the approval for transfer of 1,363 patients from acute hospitals in March 2020. That was a 70% increase on the number of people transferred in, in 2019. And HSE lead clinical director has advised that only those showing signs of COVID were for the virus. Um, and the first case of the virus was reported on the 16th of March. The, the HSC have said in a, a look back, they will try and look how many people were later diagnosed with, with COVID. And while the, the governance and the, the provision of quality of care and the ability of operations of the staff to, I suppose, respond to the pandemic have been ident identified as mitigants. The design and layout of homes have had an impact on the spread of COVID. HICWA has already identified to the National Public Health Emergency Team some homes, both public and private, where the operator would be challenged to effectively manage outbreaks with increased, increased risks with multi-occupancy rooms, insufficient bathrooms, and minimum dining and day space. In a post-COVID world, I think it's likely that we will see regulations change to force the reconfiguration of, of, of homes to include self-contained units and single ensuite bedrooms. And this might result in, in reduced bed numbers for operators. This increased regulatory focus may result in the deregistration of some homes, particularly homes where the costs have risen and significant investment would be required to reconfigure and future these homes. So, you know, looking at what's the future for nursing homes, well, as I've said here many times, uh, the good news is we're all living healthier and longer. 
by 2026, our over 80 population will increase to about 230,000, with the ESRI projecting a 39% increase in demand for residential long care, term care and a 70% increase uh, in demand for um, uh, home care services. I think uh, while much of the early debate has focused on resident outcomes during COVID, the lack of integration of long-term residential care within the health and social care framework, and what's actually funded under Fair Deal is yet to be heard. Um, it's interesting to look at the proposed uh, programme from government, not that we know whether we're going to have that, that actual government, includes the introduction of a statutory scheme to support people to live in their own homes, um, but it talks there that the, this care must be regulated. And as you know, at the moment, home care services aren't regulated. They're also looking at uh, the possibility of establishing, and it says a dementia village, although I'm not sure one will be enough given our uh, future needs. And many of innovative nursing home operators might be best placed to provide both the home care services or indeed are, have sites that will... Uh, provide for that continuum of care. You know, looking at then uh, pharmacies, well, pharmacies really are the most frequently accessed healthcare professional and have really stepped up to the fore uh, during the COVID outbreak. Always we knew that there was about 200, 2 million people visiting pharmacies uh, every month and that 20 million prescriptions were filled annually. But this is a, you know, it's a very fragmented, uh, fragmented sector, but consolidation is increasing. So every year we, we hear that we're going to lose some of uh, the number of community pharmacies, but our, uh, these have increased and our numbers of community pharmacy per capita in Ireland is very high, about 1900 pharmacies. And this sector has seen significant reform in the last decade with their EBITDA and income reducing on an annual basis. And this has resulted in, in many pharmacies moving from a dispensing model where the HSC is really the monopolistic customer who has continued to erode income through initiatives such as reference pricing to primarily a retail model where the income is derived from discretionary spend which is reliant on a buoyant economy. So with the arrival of, of COVID, uh, dispensing pharmacies initially experienced a surge in trade, particularly in over-the-counter medicines such as Panadol, as people stockpiled their, their meds as they did their, their pasta and flour. But now uh, pharmacies reported also increased dispensing as a result of the change in the legislation. But slowly, with the reduced number of visits to GPs and dentists and the reduced number of elective procedures, pharmacies are reporting a drop in the number of items dispensed with, with resultant reduced turnover. And as a result of the, the social distancing requirement, the, uh, there, there's been a, a massive reduction in retail discretionary spend and the demand for cosmetics and gifts uh, has also reduced. The Irish Pharmacy Union carried out a business survey and uh, they reported that 86% of community pharmacies uh, said that their retail business uh, had reduced by an average of 36%. We've seen our customers uh, reporting increased costs as a result of the demand to meet dispensing and to introduce solutions to reduce the infection risks. And they've had to put in perspex screens, they've had to deliver scripts and adopt new technologies. But innovative promoters are, are repurposing their um, retail spaces to focus on patients' needs. And you know, they've sections now for sanitization products, gels, masks, thermometers, uh, vitamins and really wellness products and some of them are purchasing ahead for the predicted Christmas baby boom. I'm sure Owen will talk a little bit about that in the retail sector. So the demographics and corresponding rise in, in chronic conditions are, are going to continue to favour pharmacies. But I think there will be some casualties accelerated that driven by COVID. 
uh, our number of pharmacies per capita is high. And, you know, I think it's possible that we're going to see consol further consolidation uh, in, in the sector as pharmacies look at the way they're doing businesses. So that's kind of a whistle-stop tour through the, the health sector. And uh, I'll take uh, questions at the end. And now hand you over to my colleague, Gerardo. Thanks, Larry. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks, uh, Pamela and uh, Helen uh, and the Chamber for organizing this again this morning. Well, the hospitality sector has been one that was probably the first uh, sector to be hit, and the one that would have probably been hit the hardest. Um, every single business, hotels, bars, and restaurants would have been forced to shut um, after it was just very early in the month of March. And they've been unable to trade or trade at a very reduced capacity for the last couple of months, which is very, very challenging because there's a lot of staff, there's uh, you know, previous obligations they would have, there's a number of them that would also have um, commitments in terms of rent, and that just makes it very, very hard when you have no prospect uh, of potentially trading, which was only clarified, as you all know, a couple of weeks ago, and there was the accelerated phasing that now allows and gives them more a better life because they can already resume trade from the 29th. There's obviously the, the little bit of the gray area in terms of the, of the, the pop trade that some of them would actually begin to be able to trade at the end of this month if they serve food, and some of them would actually be able to trade in the next phase, phase um, three, uh, phase four, sorry, as um, you know, we moved into the full lifting of the lockdown restrictions. Now, business owners have their eyes set on um, not only in the next phase, but especially in the next two phases, because the majority of visitors um, from the domestic demand or international demand want actually, when they travel to, to a destination, they travel for the ecosystem really of businesses. They'll be looking not only for the hotel, but they'll also be looking to go to the restaurant, they'll be looking to go to the bar, to the gift shop. And this is, this is actually a trickle down effect that actually benefit, greatly benefits communities. And, um, and that's why a number of hotels, bars and restaurants are not gonna be opening straight away. They're gonna be waiting to resume their trading um, when the whole, um, whole services uh, are available for them. Um, it'd be the tours um, that could be available in the city again, or some of the other things that would be favored by, by the visitors, including bars and restaurants. Now, it is very important that with what they do open is, is actually, it's a very timely manner because as many of the destinations in the country are very seasonal, um, operators are actually very familiar with the losses that they tend to incur during this time of year. Is that cash burn period is very important because businesses generally will just be consolidating a couple of things. They'll be focusing on maintaining their premises. And it happens in every year, just between the, the end of December and, and the first couple of, um, you know, January and February at the, end, the most. But this time around, you know, all of this, the, this excess um, period of closure is putting additional pressure on, on the cash management of those businesses. And they would really need to actually look forward, um, not to the end of this year only, but also to the beginning of the next year when that period actually naturally recurs. So opening too early or opening too late has cash implications that are being considered by many across the country. The, the opening um, early is also gonna be prompted by a number of government initiatives um, at the moment, there's been a lot of campaigns trying to actually get the wage subsidy scheme to be extended. Um, you know, we all know that it's actually in place until the end of August. For the hospitality sector, this is actually particularly important because we're talking about most businesses having 30 or 40 percent of their turnover going in to, to actually pay for the wages. And, um, and if, without the subsidy scheme, they would actually be inviolable. Um, there's an awful lot of tools out there at the moment to help businesses to try to help them to calculate at what stage do they actually turn to losses? Um, because it is something that is playing on everyone's mind. You know, should I open now? Should I open later? Would I be losing more money if I open now? The reality is that because of those government supports that are out there, a lot of businesses would actually be able to remain viable at least up to the end of August. Uh, and that's why there's been actually so many voices from the, the Restaurant Association, the Vineyard Federation, or the Hotel Federation, trying to look for the extension of those supports because they know that if, if those supports are extended for a little while longer, it might encourage more operators to reopen their doors and potentially um, you know, allow them to trade much longer into the future. Now, of course, it's, it's, it's not only the reopening that they're focusing on, they're also focused on, uh, a lot in terms of you know, the changes they'll have to do to their premises and to the way they operate and treat their customers. Um, there could be an awful lot of money that can be invested, like Hillary was saying, that has been done in, in the pharmacy sector or Owen will tell you in the retail sector. But getting the place covered in perspex and, and investing in sanitation stations is only a part of the thing. 
The biggest thing is actually obviously to do with the training and the way you adjust to try to mitigate all of those cold things, um, with the perspex, the mouth covers, because at the end of the day, hospitality industry is all about close human interactions, close human contact, and you can't deliver that um, in a cold way. It still has to be inviting, and it still has to actually you know, represent what you're actually working for. Um, that's why this probably is gonna be a little bit more difficult for more kind of like high-end products. So if, you have a, if you're running a five-star hotel, you know, people won't appreciate you having five or six receptionists and having somebody carrying perhaps their luggage to the bedroom because it will look at, you know, that's being contaminated. So it is gonna be a lot of rethinking about what you're offering to your customers and trying to make sure that it is tailored around COVID-19, but still actually making sure that it's a memorable experience because uh, nobody wants to actually go and spend the holiday in a hospital room. You still want to be able to see a bit of people watching and enjoy the atmosphere in a restaurant. And with a lot of those measures, you know, you're far away. You might not be able to overhear the conversation at the table next to you. And that all has to be experienced. So it is very important that all of those little things are considered because without that, you'd only end up having a pure service provision, a very transactional thing that might not be as memorable as what your customers are expecting to get. Now, the, the, one of the big things that we, we, we have to refocus this year is the fact that the domestic market is limited in terms of its reach. Now, it does account for about 60% of the spells in hotels, bars, and restaurants in the country, but um, the 5.6 billion that we get spent um, in, in, in Ireland from overseas visitors is quite a, quite a lot of money. And, and even though people in Ireland might not be able to travel abroad this year, and they could be spending some of the um, estimated 5 billion that is spent abroad, that actually still has fundamental challenges in terms of the way the expectations of service um, that would have to be met um, during the summer. Um, you would have, for example, that the over 60s might be a little bit more hesitant to resume to travel. So destinations that were traditionally catered for them, um, you know, like you could have some uh, a luxury place in, around Dom or East, but it's a bit more calmed down. Those places might actually have to review their offer because the reality is those traditional customers that would have been approached by email every year that would have come time and time again, might not be back until perhaps next year. Um, well, destinations like uh, Dungarvan, where there's a lot of people that would go hiking and whatever not, might find it a little bit easier because it is open spaces that their customers would have generally gone for, and that's what they offer and that's what they focus on. So it just makes it that a little bit easier for them to adjust to this new normal because they already have that edge. Now, of course, there's gonna be places that are find it more difficult, like wedding venues, um, plenty of them around in Waterford, but there's actually going to be even bigger challenges for if you're to take destinations like uh, Donegal with line dancing is actually very, very popular. That actually is, is very, very big of a challenge and you need to rethink the whole thing in terms of how you're going to be changing that offer for your customers. Um, again, family destinations like the, like the, the caravan parks and uh, like around Zamora or different places you have, it's, it's important that they reflect that increase um, the, the concerns from customers. Because the reality is a lot of the, the times what you get is families that are traveling. And if your customer base is not only, you know, uh, the parents with the children, but perhaps the grandparents that go travel with them, it is likely that this year they might choose another destination that they consider a bit safer because they might not want the grandparents exposed to the additional children. So it is about just having that extra thought about the consideration from your customers when you're actually tailoring the product for the end of the, you know, for, for the, end of the summer. Um, the recovery is also expected to actually be primarily on a regional basis first and then coming back into the larger cities. And from speaking to customers the last couple of weeks, if you were to look at the booking patterns since the acceleration of the phases, you would have seen a much bigger and stronger pickup in regional destinations like Waterford, Wexford, um, Wicklow, Kerry, because it is actually, it is away from Dublin, it is actually more remote and therefore more appealing for people that are trying to actually um, move away from the highly densely populated places, the big density areas, um, like again, like Dublin or Galway. And also the fact is that cities like Dublin, um, again, going back to the ecosystem thing, people when they come here, they go here because they're going to the theater, they might be going to the three arena to see a gig, they might be going um, to museums, and a lot of those things are not gonna be open. So this gives an advantage to locations like Waterford that have all, that, the, the, all those wonderful uh, natural resources and you have the open air spaces and everything else, that would actually strike a chord with customers. Now, it, it would actually require, again, some um, consideration in terms of those, those temporary shifts in customer, consumer behavior, because if somebody goes to water, for example, they might not want to go to the Apple market because it's actually gonna be too tight, you know, to be you know, rubbing elves against each other. 
but they might actually want to just wander around, um, I don't know, some of your beautiful shorelines. Um, and uh, again, there will be, they, they would be not winners and losers, but there'll be some that would actually have uh, bigger challenges to face uh, while some actually, some of our will actually find it a little bit easier. Um, what I will finish by saying is that even though the, the new normal will present challenges in, the, in terms of consumer behavior, it will still actually be the core of, of, of the service industry. It's actually just attention to detail and good customer, um, you know, good customer support. So if you're still focused on your customer and you're taking into account the, the changing needs and wants from that customer base, you're already going to be on the winning side. So it, it's just going to be a couple of months of tightening the bells and like, you know, just looking for those small shifts in, the, in, in, in your customer's wants and, and expectations so that you can again tailor your products. And um, what well, that's me, it's actually now up to my colleague Owen Clifford, who's the head of retail. Thank you, Gerardo. Good morning, everybody. And thank you again to Water Chamber, Waterford Chamber for the, the invite this morning. Really appreciate it. Frederick Douglass, the civil rights leader who visited Waterford in 1845 stated, we have to use the past only to make it useful for the present and the future. And I think the retailers around the country have really lived by that maxim over the last number of months. They haven't dwelled in the past, they've been proactive and progressive. And at the outset, I'd like to commend the retailers that are on the call this morning for the fantastic can-do attitude and community spirit that they've shown over the last number of months. I've long been a strong advocate of the contribution that retail makes to the country. And I think this has now been magnified amongst the wider population. And there's a real acknowledgement of the pivotal role that our retailers play in our communities nationwide and a palpable sense of goodwill out there from the community at large. And for me, this presents a real opportunity for Irish retailers to re-engage with the Irish consumer, leverage that goodwill. And once the, the customer comes back in, make sure that you deliver, as Gerardo outlined, the key principles of excellent service, accessibility and value. Those are the key principles of retail and they haven't changed and they're even more important now as the consumer makes their choice. One of the main trends that we've seen, and it's come from grocery, which has been opened during the, the length of the last few months, is the return of that staple of the, the 80s and 90s, the big weekly grocery shop. And what that tells us is that all of us as consumers, we're now much more considered. We're making a list, we're going into the store, we're not dwelling there, we're trying to get home as, as quickly as possible. It's real functional shopping. And that's understandably been driven by health and safety concerns. But again, for me, there's a real opportunity for smaller stores to service the needs of the consumer by meeting the, the need of the consumer for this type of, of, um, of less dwell time. Those stores, they're, more, they're closer, they're more accessible, there's less queues generally in the stores, and, and the retailers are more agile, able to interact with the customer advance through a video call or a phone call and tailor their product and service in advance, and then agree a time where customer can pick it up at a time that suits them. Essentially, up-weighted click and collect offering. And there's an opportunity for retailers around the country to be innovative and, dare I say it, play to their strengths and put the fun into functional shopping, if at all possible. At the moment, the principal concern for consumers, they want a safe, frictionless shopping environment. And for retailers to achieve this, there's a number of areas that they need to focus on. First of all, the most important brand ambassadors that any retailer has are their, their staff. Their staff need to be fully au fait and fully comfortable with all the health and safety requirements. And it's not just doing the health and safety requirements at the start, there needs to be continuous training around those health and safety requirements because if the staff aren't comfortable in their environment, that will feed onto the customers, obviously. In terms of the customers, what we're seeing from customers at the moment that it's, as I said, it's, it, predetermined a lot of the time from customers going into a store. They, they're only going in if they want to make a purchase. And we're seeing the conversion rate around the country is very, very high. There isn't a lot of browsing going on. There isn't a lot of dwell time in the stores. So for a number of retailers, they're faced with a challenge. How do I keep engaged with the customers if they only want to come in when they want something? Uh, will they forget about me if they're not visiting my store? So what I would say is keep in touch through social media, text message, pick up the phone, give really valuable, relevant content to your customers. Don't let them forget about you, keep in touch with them. And once they come back in, then shower them with that service, accessibility and value that Irish retailers are famous for. The other key pillar is suppliers. At the moment, we've got a very interconnected uh, 
economy in Ireland. And we need to make sure that there, there's proper communication and collaboration between retailers and their suppliers. What I've seen is where proactive retailers have been in touch with their suppliers. They've got better credit terms, not just on the stock that they have, but they've also got better credit terms in terms of future purchases for the remainder of 2020 and into 21 as well. So proactive communication opposite suppliers is key. Online, of course, is a key area. And online has been a lifeline for numerous retailers over the last number of months. But it isn't the panacea that some commentators would make it out to be in terms of the retail sector. It's a very expensive channel on a standalone basis. I've been speaking to numerous retailers around the country, and they've been really surprised at the delivery costs associated with online over the last number of months. And these are retailers who would have had an existing online operation. But up to now, it had been absorbed within their bricks and mortar operation, so they'd never looked at it and assessed it on a standalone basis. For me, the optimum approach is a, an omni-channel approach where you get the, the best of online and bricks and mortar, fuse them together and give a real strong offering for the customer. And there's no surprise that the likes of Alibaba and Amazon, who were to the forefront in terms of online, have moved into brick, purchasing bricks and mortar stores over the last number of years and will continue to do so. There's a real opportunity for Irish retail at the moment in terms of online, because at present 70% of online sales are going overseas. So the Irish retail sector needs to work collaboratively to rectify that alarming statistic and to onshore online, make sure that more of the online activity stays in Ireland. And how can they do that? They can do that by giving their, their online store a real in-store feel. Want to make sure there's an availability for one-to-one -one appointments. Give that personal touch. Make sure that the, the site is easy to navigate. There aren't out of stocks. It's easy to find the most popular products. Too often over the last number of, of months, I've spoken to people who have gone into a website, gone the whole way through to checkout, and right at the end they're told that the product is out of stock. We need to manage the customer's expectations with our online, our online offering. Also in terms of delivery, if you can't deliver within 24 hours, there's an expectation with a lot of people that you'll get delivered within 24 hours. If you can't do it, say it at the outset. Under promise and over deliver. That's important in terms of the online offering. Stock management also is a key area. And especially in some sectors such as fashion, as we know, stock can go out of style and out of season very, very quickly. So again, what I would say, engage with, the, engage with your suppliers, have a strategy around the stock. Now, some retailers in, in respect of their stock strategy. But I would urge caution in terms of a discount strategy because what you don't want is the customer feeling that your whole proposition is based around discounting. You can undervalue and, and undermine the goodwill and the heritage that you may have built up with your brand over a number of years by going completely down the discount route over the next couple of months. So again, proceed with caution in that respect. And the, the, another key area, personnel. The type of personnel that retailers will require into the future is going to change. People with, skill, with a skill set around e-commerce, logistics, social media, finance, they're all going to be key and they'll have to take an active role in an organization. And many retailers that I know, they're one or two people that are, are running the whole show. So there's a, there's a, there's, um, there could be an issue for some retailers where they may burn out. They're trying to do too much too soon. What I would say is use the resources that are, that are out there. Engage with your local chamber, engage with your local enterprise office, or get in touch with, with myself in terms of the, the retail sector more than happy to speak to any retailers that are on the call or around their strategy and get them in touch with professional advisors and people who have a, an expertise in these key areas which will be required into the future for their business. What are we seeing at the moment in terms of the, the European experience and as the Irish stores are starting to open? Well, we're seeing that it's, it's very sec sub-sector specific and it's very location specific in terms, of, in terms of sales. There is certainly some pent up demand out there and DIY, hardware stores, mobile phone stores, pennies, of course, as we saw with, with the queues um, in the last number of weeks. But it's probably a bit early in terms of seeing what, what type of sales trends will, will come out of COVID and, and what we will see developing from a sales trends perspective on, until we have management figures for, for June, July and August. What we are hearing, though, from retailers is that their sales at the moment are at 50, 50 and 60 percent of where they were this time last year. So again, a real challenge for, for retailers. And with that, it's absolutely key that the retailers around the country have a live, agile business plan in place. I can't overemphasize that enough. 
it doesn't need to be a war and peace two to three pages that sets out where you're going to where you're going to go with your business over the next couple of months especially if your sales levels are at that level of 60 to 50 percent compared to last year and the key areas around the business plan that i'd ask people to, to look at are your customers how you're going to engage with your customers your staff and your suppliers those three pillars are key also then your sales channel, is it going to be through bricks and mortar? Is it going to be through online? Is it going to be through a combination of both? Your margin, how can you preserve margin and grow margin in time? Eliminate waste. Is, is, there, is there alternative supply channels that you can tap into to purchase better and at a better, at a better cost price to improve your margin? In terms of cost, your cost base, your property costs, energy efficiency, insurance costs, all key. And another area that's really important, cybersecurity. As more and more people will be using your, your online platform, you need to make sure that the integrity of that online platform is absolutely robust. All it can take is for one blip in terms of cybersecurity and a lot of goodwill you've built up will be eroded overnight. The Irish consumer in their shopping preferences over the next no, number of months, they're gonna have COVID at, at the back of their head. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's that Community and health and wellness are, are absolutely key for us. So in making their shopping preferences, they're going to be looking for not just value, but the values that the retailer brings to the party as well. Now, in terms of value and values, price is going to be, is going to be key. Again, with it, with some element of discounting will be required, but price isn't everything. Re the consumer, when they're engaging with a retailer, they're going to look at the community values, the Irishness of the product, does it align with their, their own health and wellness agenda? Is it environmentally friendly? Is it sustainable? The traceability and the provenance of the products, they're all going to be absolutely key for consumers with their shopping de decisions. And it's something that needs to be factored into the business plan that you as retailers will be developing over the coming weeks and months. In terms of the, the government, and Hillary would have touched on the program for government in terms of the, the, the health sector. It's, my personal view is that we do need a, a spe specific focus and task force in place for retail and the program for government has outlined that that, that, that is part of their July, their July stimulus. So obviously we will await that with, with, with interest and we get the detail, the devil will be in the detail. They've also spoken about um, rebooting and, and, and reviving town centres, about putting a code of conduct in place for landlords and tenants. All of those are absolutely key but again the devil will be in the detail and we, we will need to see um, what, what, what's delivered. As I said earlier the Irish economy is so interlinked that if the appropriate supports aren't put in place for the likes of retail and hospitality who have been disproportionately affected by COVID well they will be weak links in that overall change in, chain and it could have a domino effect on the, on the wider SME economy so real action is absolutely required. If I'm looking at, at, at the, the future for, for Irish retail, I'm a realist. It's going to be challenging for, for Irish retailers without doubt. But I'm also very positive because we do have world-class retailers out there who have a, a real entrepreneurial spirit and a can-do attitude. And with the right support, I feel that the majority will emerge stronger and, and more viable businesses. There's an opportunity around online. There's real goodwill there from, from the Irish consumer to support them. I think it was Mary Portis, the retail guru, who recently said, we need to think of every euro we spend as a vote for the type of community we want for the future. And I'd fully concur with that type of assessment. We should all try and support our local retailers as best we can in the coming weeks and months ahead. Thank you very much. Looking forward to, to hearing your questions. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to uh, Hilary, to Owen and to Gerardo. If there are any questions, we'll happily take them now. So you can pop them in through the chat um, function on, on your Zoom if you want to uh, put in any there. And in the meantime, guys, if you, got, if you have any questions, maybe that have come in to you or maybe we could um, uh, hand over to Pam. Um, just from a, just while we're waiting on some questions to come in, just from a local perspective, um, I take it that it's business as usual for you guys at the moment. Hi everybody, good morning. Um, on a little bit of a wet morning here in Worshford. Um, yeah, look, it is very much business as usual. We have been um, open really all through the crisis and um, 
you know, in fairness to my team, you know, it's a very kind of dark days and, um, you know, they, they've, they've been here every day, which is just brilliant. So, um, you know, we're, we'd be delighted uh, to speak to any customers who need support. Um, I'm based in, on the key here myself, but I, I am obviously traveling a little bit um, more now that things have opened up a little bit. Um, so, yeah, so Helen, uh, obviously, and the business center are also um, open for business and have been through the crisis as well. And, and you know, we have helped a huge amount of customers um, locally through, you know, payment breaks, be it on the mortgage side or small business and agri side as well. So um, we'd be delighted to help in any way that we can. And obviously, if anybody wants direct access to any of our sector specialists, we, we actually have 10 sectors within Bank of Ireland. And I guess today we chose the three sectors that we thought would be most relevant to, um, you know, the, the members of the chamber. So, yeah, come to us. We'd be delighted to help in any way that we can. And we're very much open for business, Linda. Thanks, Pam. Appreciate that. Uh, we don't appear to have any questions at the moment. So if anybody does have questions and they want to send them through to me, uh, they're more than welcome to do that. Today's session was recorded, so it will be sent out and available on our social media channels because I know we had a number of email requests from people saying they couldn't make today's sessions, but they are keen to, to, uh, to engage. So uh, I suppose on that note, we'll finish up. Um, I hope everybody has a great day and thank you for joining us on as Pam said, what is a bit of a wet and dull morning here in Waterford. Um, wishing, ev oh, hold on, I think we may have a question just as, uh, just as we were about to finish. Uh, so this is uh, for hotels. Uh, what changes are taking place in accommodation and cleaning? So Gerardo, I think that's yes, the um, idea. In terms of accommodation, well, there's a lot of automation that's going to be happening now. I'm discussing quite a few of the customers that we would have. Um, and it's just, there's a lot of systems that hotels would have already had. And nobody really was activating those things, you know, for allowing people to check in online before they would arrive to the property um, or to access their the, 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 the rooms with things like with their phones or other devices or whatnot. So we're going to see quite a bit of that. Um, hotels just really activating things that were already in place. Um, and then just protocols in terms of checking in, uh, there'll be just revised uh, revised flows for in, in a lot of the premises. And in terms of it, it, the big part would actually be in, indeed the, the housekeeping um, of the premises. Uh, first of all, it's just going to be a matter of telling customers that the rooms have been cleaned and how thoroughly have they been cleaned and what actions have been taken. I know that most hotels, bars and restaurants would have already had a very, very strict uh, cleaning protocols in place. But it's no longer going to be enough to have those protocols. It's actually going to be telling the story again and again to make sure that it resonates with the customers and that they actually fully understand the effort that has been put in place to ensure their safety and comfort. Um, so I think that's actually the crucial part within housekeeping. There will be additional things, um, uh, all right. But I mean, the main thing is actually just going to be the, the focus on, on telling the story. I've discussed with a few customers that are buying uh, fogging machines, for example, but those are very expensive and they could damage furniture. So it's, it's actually just about being cautious about what, what measures are implemented because there's quite a few things that would cost quite a few bob that are might not be environmentally friendly. And uh, so it is just important to take consideration of what things are gonna be, you know, uh, embedding into the culture uh, of your property. One of the things that I have seen that is quite generic is the fact that what, before the, the rooms are clean, for example, a lot of the, the hotels have implemented a disinfection first so you're gonna send somebody else in full gear to disinfect all the, the, the proper areas that need to be, to be disinfected. And then the cleaner is gonna go into the room to actually deal with it, the hoovering and whatever not. But even before they get in, somebody just to disinfect. And then afterwards, there's a number of solutions like the scans that you put in the room that again, that just do a clean disinfection before you put a seal up to ensure the customer believes and knows that everything is actually being left disinfected before they walk in. But there's also gonna be a lot of plastic and a lot of, you know, wrapping things just to make sure that people know that after it was disinfected, it was covered and nobody else touched it. So I think, again, I think it's just being, being mindful of the, the implications in terms of the environment, because I think the green agenda needs to remain relevant. Uh, so just take that into account. Perfect. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, I'll just see, I think we may have another one or two coming in. Uh, yes, so what's the panelists' view on the expected second wave? How will banks react? Do you think we will go back into lockdown? 
So, um, oh, Gerard Oak, one, you're, you're bursting at the mid <laughs> Listen, no, nobody knows, you know, they would be actually been gazing into a crystal ball. So there's, there's, if the government doesn't have an answer, we wouldn't really have an answer. If there's a second way, we will still be supporting our customers. I think whatever solutions we put in place have always been tailored. Um, and is the same, the expectation is that, like Owen was actually saying, that there'll be a sector by sector approach um, that we will have. The expectation is the same, the government would actually be able to do something similar. We are expecting a, a, a recovery in sector by sector uh, uh, for SBNA uh, progress to be released by the government uh, in stages. So I think all of that would actually cover in, in case there's actually a second wave that would already cover all that. Okay, and Hilary, I might just put the question to you because the, the person that posed the question is actually a healthcare Hi. professional. So if, uh, if you would like to add to it. I, I, I was just going to come in there, Linda. Look, I hope, um, it, well, first of all, we all hope that there isn't a second wave, but as the numbers globally are going up, I suppose there are some concerns. But what I would hope is that the health sector, that we would take on rapid learning uh, from maybe uh, some of the, are they mistakes or some of the way that things were handled, uh, particularly in the uh, residential care sector, where we didn't protect that sector first and foremost, there was a there was a big focus on the uh, the acute sector, and not on looking after the most vulnerable of our of our systems, not just our people, but it's probably we've learned that the systems are vulnerable and that we weren't able to 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 manage the pandemic. So I would hope that the lessons would be learned from that. And indeed, lessons for from the pandemic we would roll out for, say, flu when the flu uh, season arrives, because that will arrive quickly. And if we have uh, a, a, sur a surge in COVID at the same time as the flu, the system certainly will be, the health system will be very under pressure. So uh, it's, it's all about learning the lessons and, uh, you know, implementing rapid learning, Linda. Thanks, Thanks for so And just sorry, Helen, um, just before we, we conclude today, uh, obviously businesses are still really keen to, to access supports that are available. Um, they're, they're going through a tough enough times, so I'm trying to come out the other side. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about what supports are available for SMEs at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Linda. Um, so look, as Gerardo would have mentioned there and Hilary indeed as well and Owen throughout their presentations, like it is very sector specific, the impact of um, the crisis on the various different um, parts of the economy, I suppose. So obviously the SBCI, Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland, have come out with a number of SME support schemes um, via the government. And um, obviously the bank are participating in supporting some of those. So I might just briefly run through what and if people want to speak, you know, a bit more about them, they can contact us directly, Pam, myself, or any of the branch, uh, branch teams locally. So there's the SBCI COVID-19 Working Capital Loan Scheme. Um, you know, that covers amounts from 25,000 up to 1.5 million. It the maximum term of three years, which for some people at this moment in time is considered to be relatively short, but I suppose it is a working capital loan scheme as opposed to for capital investment. Again, like maybe some of the expenditure that the guys may have spoken about in terms of, you know, refit required for businesses to reopen. Um, so and, you know, the appropriate way of funding that. Um, so there's also then the PCI Future Growth Loan Scheme. So the amounts in that are 100,000 up to 3 million. At the moment, um, they're probably looking at the term of that. It's due to reopen and it's hoping to be live in around the end of July. That's the one, I suppose, again, that comes with the government. Um, you know, we do require a government to be in place to pass legislation in relation to that. But it's anticipated that that term would be five to 10 years, which, you know, may be a more appropriate term for some people in relation to, I suppose, the investment required and, and, you know, keeping repayments at a certain level. There's also then the credit guarantee scheme, which is loans from 10,000 up to a million euro, maximum term of seven years. Um, and, you know, looking at that, but there's been an announcement over the weekend, I think, as well, in relation to that, that they're talking about a different, um, you know, some alterations to that scheme that may make it more beneficial for some people. I suppose the key thing in relation to those to say at the moment is, you do go to the 
um, SBCI and confirm your eligibility initially and then come to the bank with your loan application. Um, and I suppose the SBCI do ask us to apply normal credit criteria in relation to those. So it is important that people are aware that just because they are confirmed eligible via SBCI, it does not necessarily mean that there will be loan approval. But at the same time, we would look at all options and opportunities for people best way that we can support businesses and you know what might be the most appropriate way for them to access finance if that's something that they need and we can look through that with them and um, so I suppose those are important things for people to be aware of and obviously there are you know there was the initial payment break is for further payment break available for people and we will respond as required you know over the coming months as the, the situation evolves. Perfect. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> Sorry, just one more question here before we finish up. Uh, so given retail demand is now back to normal in the city, so Owen, this is obviously for you, uh, mm -hmm. by looking at the central bank daily POS spend, what exact actions are being lent to retail and tourism in terms of lending? And how will the six billion of grants for SMEs be accessed and when? Well, I think, thank you. T taking, the second, taking the second question, I think Helen has covered that, Linda, ar around the, the different supports that are in place from the government. Yeah. And again, we will need a new government in place to put legislation in place around, around those, um, those grants. So that, that's the, the second point. In terms of the, the retail and, and new lending, look, we've been active throughout, the, throughout COVID in terms of providing new lending for, for retailers. Again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So if, if somebody has a requires an, an investment in their business what i would say is to pull, pull together their 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 application and speak with helen or, or pamela there and again we'll, we'll look at it we're absolutely have supported retailers over the last number number of months with with requests for revamping their business and, and investing in their business and and their people so that continues to be the way and it's very much on a on a, on a case by case basis but more than more than happy to look at new retail um lending opportunities of course in waterford Perfect. Thanks, Owen. Okay, folks. Well, I think that kind of concludes it today. Um, there's work to be done, so I guess we, we best get on with it. Just uh, to say thank you to Hilary, to Gerardo, to Owen, and of course our, our local people, Pamela and Helen. Um, Pam and Helen are, of course, available to speak with any of you if you have any requirements in terms of your banking. Uh, thank you once again to everybody. I hope you have a fantastic day and really appreciate the support of Bank of Ireland at all times. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Cheers. Thanks, Thank all. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.